All right, so open ArcMap. And by now, if you've downloaded those uh, files, save them somewhere on your desktop just for now. But I assume you guys have a, like a, a courses folder somewhere where you can save all your data into a database. So eventually, you guys want to have a shared database of shape files so that uh, you know you can start to collect your resources. When you open ArcMap, this is what you see. You see, essentially, the majority of your space is what's known as the data frame. This is this white box in the middle. And this is where you're going to view all the information that you collect from GIS. GIS doesn't uh, hold data. It simply displays data. So if you add layers to your ArcMap document, it's not going to make the file size bigger. Um, it's just going to simply you know, make the layer list longer. But all your data is stored on somewhere on the server or somewhere on your desktop. So that's how ArcMap works in terms of visualizing data. The first thing we need to do is we first need to add data to, this, to the map. Actually, before I, sorry, I probably I skipped ahead too far. First, you need to find data. Um, so I, the data set that I gave you guys was some data that I found simply through doing some quick research on GIS in those cities. Um, what I'll focus on for the majority of this tutorial is the Kansas City site. And so all you do generally is you search for Kansas City GIS. and uh, this is the easiest way to find information for any city. It's just to simply go on the, the, the city or county website and see what information they provide available for you. So the information that I got for Kansas City came from this website here. Um, and I believe I saved this link to the little Word document that I, you guys should have gotten the email. It's right uh, here, I believe, yes. Um, and here you can get some very, very actually detailed information on Kansas City in this little download tab right here. And what I downloaded for today's tutorial was the uh, cadaster and the impervious surfaces um, geodatabases, these two things here. And if you click those two things, you'll just download them onto your, your, uh, your computer. But I already downloaded these two, so you don't need to download them. It's just download the link that I, I gave you. So that's for, for Kansas City. This is a pretty good resource. For St. Louis, um, I'm going to search for St. Louis GIS real quick. Um, St. Louis has some public data sets. It's not, the most, it's not as comprehensive as uh, Kansas City's, in my opinion. And I've done a lot of research in terms of what data sets can you find for St. Louis for the longest time and longest time. And the truth is, uh, St. Louis data is kind of hard to find. But this website right here, and I believe this link also is in the Word document. Yep, it is that I sent you guys. This has some very good uh, basic information on GS information. And the most important. <coughs> information from this uh, data set is the, the parcel information right here. Because um, what you can do is you can join the parcel information with tax records and you can get things like land use, land values, um, all that good stuff. That is extremely important when you're doing some of these uh, large scale urban design work. So this is a good uh, resource for St. Louis City uh, data sets. But if we need more data sets, uh, I can probably assist with finding information because I've collected years of data from all my work. Um, I'm not sure exactly specifically what you guys need, but uh, for now, this is a good place to start. And the last resource that I will share with you guys that I think is a very good resource is the open data, open, open source, uh, sorry, open street map uh, resource. So there is a website called download.geofabric.de. And again, this is on the Word document. This is open street map data. Um, that is freely available for pretty much any site in the entire world. Um, so for North America, all you need to do is you go to the North America button right here, um, and you can basically download information for any state that you want. And this includes things like roads, uh, buildings, uh, natural areas, land uses, uh, cities, population data, all that stuff. It's not the most comprehensive set, but it's good enough for a lot of things. So I believe in the package that I sent you guys to download, I downloaded the Missouri uh, uh, data set right here. And that's because Kansas City and St. Louis are both in the same state, so it's nicely uh, contained in one state. But if you need data sets for any other state, this, in my opinion, is the first place I go just to get some base information. Any questions about finding data? But that's pretty much, in a nutshell, what it is. Googling your city GIS, and then finding the shape files that you need. OK. This, what you want to download is the SHP, the zip file. These two other formats you won't be able to uh, view within ArcMap. So you always want to download the SHP zip file right here. 
Uh, I've never I've never found any use for these other two. I think they're probably good for different software platforms, but not for what we need. <coughs> okay, again, all these links, uh, I'm recording this video here, so if you forget, don't worry, uh, you'll be able to see it again. All right, so back to ArcMap. So we're gonna start by adding some layers uh, to our ArcMap. Before you're, you can add layers, you need to connect to a folder using the Arc Catalog. So uh, on the side, or rather up here on your main toolbar, you'll see a little button that looks like a little red series of red box, uh, series of yellow boxes. Uh, that is your catalog, your Arc Catalog essentially. And this is essentially a sort of a browser that you that's built within ArcMap that allows you to bring data sets into your data frame. Um, and in order to add data, you have to be connected to the folder within which your data is saved. So what, the way you do that is you click on this little button here called Connect to Folder in the Arc Catalog. If you click on that, it brings up a little dialog, and you will have to find the folder where you save your data. So in my case. I save that folder on my desktop. It's right here, it's called Copy of Tutorial Data. It has the Kansas City and St. Louis folders where I saved all the shape files. So just click on that folder and click OK. And you'll see that it uh, pops up in your folder connections right here. And now you'll be able to add all the data that is within those folders. And this would be a shared file? Or you, they would each one with their own copy. I would recommend this be, you have one for your personal uses, so if you're working with your own files and you don't want to share with people, you maybe put it on your own computer. But this would all be basically, at the end, they could be connected to the courses drive or wherever you're saving all your information, so you all can share it at once. Um, okay, so we're going to start with Kansas City. Oh, before I say it, the, the other way to add data is just to click on this little plus icon up here called Add Data and you'll be able to also access this, the photo connections <coughs> the same way. It's the exact same thing as the catalog. They're both the same. Um, uh, it's just whatever you choose. So the first thing we're going to do is I want you guys to go to the Kansas City folder here and I want you to add some layers from the Impervious Surfaces Geo Database. So if you expand this little silver looking cylinder, this is a Geo Database. I'm not going to talk about Geo Databases. That's a bit more of an advanced uh, uh, ArcMap thing, but basically it's, you can just think of it as a group that hosts a bunch of uh, shapefiles in one set. Um, so this is what you'll get when you download the information from uh, Kansas City. So I want you to just bring that impervious services layer into your data frame just by dragging it into the, uh, the data frame window here. And this is what you'll be able to download from that, uh, the, the resource that I showed you. And this is, in many senses, a gold mine of data because it's all the impervious areas of the Kansas City urban region. And this is, will allow you to do city modeling and uh, really, really cool diagrams uh, just from this data set alone. So if you zoom in to this data set, let's say you go into the downtown region, you'd be able to see that it has roads, buildings, uh, sidewalks, paved roads, uh, gravel surfaces, everything. So you have everything you need here basically to do some to start your projects uh, right now. I'm, 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 I'm sad for me to say, but I don't think St. Louis has this kind of information publicly available. So for St. Louis to be a bit more creative with how you access data. So Kansas City is, is where to start <laughs> for some of this stuff. So since we're thinking about comparing the two cities, it's worth noting, oh, you know, St. Louis, you are lacking data publicly available. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. If you call uh, the Missouri Surrey Sewer District, MSD, um, they have impervious data set layers for the entire city of St. Louis. So you can get that information, but you have to contact some public officials to get that information. So maybe give them an email or see if you can get data for educational purposes. Um, that's a good place to start. And we don't have that stuff in the library? I have to check with them. I'm not sure. I, 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 mean, I don't know what kind of basis WashU has, but that's actually a good question for the librarian. They might actually have, WashU I think already has a good database of some uh, of, uh, St. Louis um, based data sets. Okay, so if you look at this data set right now, you'll kind of notice that it is running fairly slowly. Uh, this is going to be a problem that you guys will run into as you build your maps is that adding more data into your map and adding more complex data is going to slow down your workflow. So the first things you need to do is to manage your map and your data frame so that it doesn't slow you down. So you're not always bogged down by the, the high amount of detail in this. So I'm going to show you guys a few ways that you can take this data and 
begin to simplify it so that it's a lot more manageable for uh, what you do. Before uh, you do anything in terms of, of setting up your maps, you need to set up your coordinate system. This is the most important thing about setting up maps is making sure you have the correct coordinate system. And if you know anything about coordinate systems, it's just basically how the map uh, figures out how to make the curvature of the Earth into a flat 2D drawing. So that's what the coordinate system figures out. Uh, and the way you set that is by going into the data frame properties. The way you get to the data frame properties is just simply by double clicking the layers uh, uh, line in the, your table of contents, you'll bring up the data frame properties right here. And what you want to set up is, the, is within this coordinate system tab right here. Now, luckily, uh, the, when you usually add a layer, with the first layer you add to your ArcMap document is are going to have a coordinate system uh, embedded within it, and so it'll default to that coordinate system. Coordinate system. In this case, it defaulted to the uh, Missouri West uh, NAD 1983 coordinate system, which is the correct coordinate system for Kansas City. But if, for instance, it doesn't do that, what you need to do is you need to search for the correct coordinate system by simply typing in the state, if you're in North America, that you are looking for your data in, or your data, your map is going to be located. So in this case, Missouri. You want to go to the projected coordinate <coughs> systems. You want to go to the state plane folder. And you always want to go to the NAD 1983 option. And uh, since, we're in, since we're working in the United States, we should use US feet as our units. Um, and then you need to pick one of the three options for whichever or whatever option that you get for your state. In this case, Kansas City is on the west of Missouri, so you want to pick Missouri West um, as your state plane system. So you just double click on that and click OK. Um, since it already was set that a coordinate system, nothing changed, uh, but that's OK. So I'm going to save this document right now just so I don't lose any progress. Uh, Kansas City. OK. So. Everybody doing OK? Everybody following along OK? Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going as fast as I can because I don't have time. i got to teach you everything in two hours. Everything I know from three years of work. Um, okay, so first thing I'm going to do is let's say we want to take this map here and we want to split it up into several different layers of information because right now everything is on one uh, layer, buildings, roads, everything, and that's a bit too, too much for us. Let's say you just want to make a figure ground map real quick um, of just the buildings. The way to figure that out is first you need to understand how to interpret the data within this. And that is figured out by opening what is known as the attribute table within each of the layers. So if you right click on a layer, you're able, you're, you can get into this option called open attribute table. And this is essentially the information. This is, the, this is what makes GIS GIS, is this table right here. Every single object within this data set has information about it. Uh, what kind of uh, object it is. In this case, it tells you what kind of impervious surface it is, what date it was acquired, um, along with a lot of other features. Sometimes this includes things like building heights. Sometimes this includes things like road names. This is really the most important thing about your data uh, in JS, and this is what you can use to visualize and do some data visualization and all, this, all that fun stuff. If you click on, for instance, an object, Using, so you can click on this little select features mouse icon here, and let's say you, you know, click on, say, this bridge here, and you see it highlights in, in uh, cyan. You can see your selected objects by simply clicking on this little uh, button at the bottom of the attribute table called Show Selected Records, and it shows you what you selected, and you can get all the information about that particular object right there. Or you can conversely select objects straight on the table here, and you can see where that object lies within the map. Um, but since we have like a million objects here, I'm not going to be able to find it. So we're not worrying about that. If you want to deselect an object, you just simply click on this little white button here called Clear Selection. OK. So how do we get the buildings to be on its own layer? What we need to do is we need to basically select every single object that is a building. If we look at the building layer here, uh, let's just click on a building, for instance, this one right here, and look at what kind of object it is. It's in subtype CD, which is what describes what kind of surface it is. Surface it, is. it says structures. So it doesn't, it doesn't call these buildings buildings, it calls them structures. 
So we need to select every object that has the category of uh, structure, basically. So the way we do that is you go to this little menu right here, table options, click on the drop down arrow, and click on this button called select by attributes. What this allows you to do is it allows you to select items based on what their description or what their property is. In this case, we want to take the subtype CD, which is the uh, type of impervious surface, click on that, click on this button called get unique values, and th what this is going to do is it's going to figure out every single item, basically this list here, so that you can pick from it. So just give it a second and let that thing process. So here we go, you have all the different uh, surface types for this, uh, this layer. So select from, double click this subtype CD so that it, when you double click that, it brings it into the selection dialog. You want to type in subtype C equals and then find the structures option here and double click that. So once that's set like that, you click apply. And just give it a second to figure it out. Okay. So once it's done, you just click close. It's, uh, all the buildings are now selected. So if you look at the map now, all the buildings are now selected in blue or the cyan color. So with that selection still made, right click on your layer, go to data, then click on export data. It's gonna ask you what to export. You wanna, you're gonna to wanna to export the selected features Use the same coordinate system as the data frame. This means it's going to match the data frame that you set, basically the coordinate system that you set um, uh, at the beginning of this. And then it's gonna ask you to have, uh, save it in location. I would recommend just saving it in your, the folder wherever you uh, uh, save your information. So in this case, I'll just save it back into my Kansas City folder. And I'll just simply call this uh, structures KC for Kansas City, but you can call it whatever you want. Then just click OK, then let that export. And when it's finished, you'll see that you've essentially isolated the building layer onto a separate layer, separate from all the roads, separate from everything else. So you can export this individually and you can do geoprocessing with that individually. It'll save you a lot of time and it will also be uh, run a lot faster. So you can use the exact same process that I showed you for every single one of these surface layers, roads, sidewalks, everything. Um, so when it says, do you want to add the exported data to the map as a layer, click yes. And then it will add that to your layer. And then to deselect everything, just let me click on this white button right here, clear selected features, and now you're done. So then if you unselect or check off the original impervious surface layers, then you will have uh, essentially a basic figure ground map of Kansas City now. Okay, so I'm gonna do one more operation with that same process, I'm gonna export the roads. So same exact process, we'll do it one more time. So open the attribute table. Um, let's just see what layer the road is on. It's gonna be on the uh, paved roads layer. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to the uh, select by attributes tab, get the unique values for that. Select CD equals paved roads. Apply. Do you want to find out more about each of those? Does it give you information? Like, will it just tell you what paved roads actually entails? What do you mean by that? Like, like small roads, medium sized roads, large roads, highways. Oh, uh, I will show you a data set that has that information. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll show you a data set that has that. This is simply physical information. This is geometric information. It's all about what, how it actually lays on the map. But what you're talking about is road types, and uh, there is a good data set for that. For any of the, of the categories you're talking about, just the, the kind of detailed information behind the categories. The yeah, category. everything about every single information is what you see on this list here. If it's not on this list, then you might need to find a different data set, or you need to join data to this data set in order to expand on that information. So 
Um, let me just export this real quick. Uh, to do what you just described, uh, you have to go to the attribute tables. You want to select, say, subtype CD, you know, equals. Let me get my unique values again real quick. You can you can do multiple uh, attributes in one selection, and you can export that together as one layer. So in this case, I'll do subtype CD equals, like you said, structures, or subtype CD equals. Uh, green roof. If you click apply, you get both in one selection. So then you can you so you've been looking at data a lot more closely. So now you you understand that it's not just structures that's something to look at, but it's also the green roofs. So now if you look at the data set, um, all all the selection now has structures and well there should be some green roofs, but it's mostly structures. But yeah, you get what I mean there. So then you just take this selection, you export that together, and that's going to be one layer. So uh, that's how you would address that. OK. So now we have roads uh, and structures. Now we want to visualize uh, this information in interesting ways. So now we're getting into the, cat to the uh, topic of symbology. Symbology is simply how do you take this image here and begin to represent it in interesting ways so that you can, you can begin to talk about a story that is about this information. And you can only really visualize what information that you have embedded within the uh, attribute table. So in this case, let's say it's not the most interesting thing to visualize, but for instance, the area of the building, the actual uh, impervious plan area of that. If you double click on any layer, you can go to what is known as the symbology tab right here. And here it gives you a lot of options on how to visualize this information in interesting ways. You can just visualize everything the same way, which is just you know, the first option here. And let's say you want to give it you know, just a black uh, fill with no outline. This is you know, your classic figure ground map. But let's say you want to visualize this based on the area of each of the footprints. So you can go to the quantities option in the symbology tab, go to the graduated colors option here, and you can visualize it based on the shape area. And then it will, what it will allow you to do is allow you to pick the number of categories um, or classes that you want to visualize it. So in this case, there's only five, but if you, let's just do five for now. If you click apply, um, you'll see that it's visualizing it um, based off the footprint area. So smaller buildings are blue, larger, not larger in terms of height, but larger in terms of footprint. Um, those are red. Not the, again, not the most interesting thing to look at, but I'm just demonstrating the uh, the use of symbology uh, as it relates to the attribute table. But then you can also increase the number of classes. Say you want to increase the number of, of uh, categories. Let's say you want to have a nice larger gradient. Uh, there you go. So it's a little bit more interesting like that. A more interesting thing to show would be, uh, like Linda said, was like row types and uh, that kind of thing. So go back to your ARC catalog real quick and go to the file uh, folders that I gave you, and go to, this is going to seem weird, go to the St. Louis folder, and go to the Missouri Latest.shp folder. And what this is is actually the open data, open street map data that you can download from that uh, open street, street map uh, website. This is actually not just for St. Louis, but this is the roads for uh, all, all the roads in, uh, in Missouri. So if you drag the roads layer in here, what this gives you is a map of all the road center lines in uh, Missouri. Now, this data set is really, really, really uh, heavy. So I'm going to show you a way to simplify this, because uh, this is the road network, every single road in Missouri. You're, you're going to get a lot of roads, so we don't need that much information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first turn on the uh, uh, structures building layer just so I can get a sense of the extents of Kansas City. Let's say we want roads for, well, you guys are really focusing on the uh, central business district area, so let's just focus on that region. So set your map to kind of represent the area you want to focus at, like say this area right here. 
Once that's set, right click. I'm not going to, I don't need to turn the road layer on. I just need to know that it's going to export within this viewport here. Right click, right click on the road layer. Go to data. Again, export data. And this time, click this option, all features in view extent. Now what it's going to do is simply only export the layers that are within this white box, the data frame. The trick is to get that the same every time, if that's what you want. Ex that, that's a good point, actually. Uh, what Linda is saying is we want this box to be the same every single time. Um, so actually, a good way to make sure that always happens is to set bookmarks. Um, so let's say uh, this, this frame here is the extent of your site or your, your analysis. And you always want to remember this is your site. Um, so you picked a nice looking frame here um, that you want to keep. Go to, go to the bookmark menu here and uh, create the, click this option called create bookmark. And just give it a name, Kansas City CBD, for instance, for Central Business District. <clears throat> and then what happens is if you lose your position, you can always go back to this location just by clicking on that. So with this, with this selected, I have this uh, window set. I'm going to go back to my roads layer, right click, go to data, export data, export all features and view extents. Use the same coordinate system as the data frame. Again, I recommend this option. And then export this. It's going to go to the Kansas City layer. I'm going to just call this um, road type KC for Kansas City. Click Save, click OK. And then when that's done, I'm just going to remove the original roads there because I already have what I want in terms of in terms of my extent already saved there, so I won't have to. Um... <coughs> I won't have to deal with the, the larger Missouri road map. So click Yes. Then I'm just going to remove the original one because I don't need it anymore. And you'll see now this runs really smoothly and runs really fast. It's not as uh, 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 slow as the previous data set. If you open the attribute table for this particular data set that you find in the uh, uh, OpenStreetMap, you, you can see right here is what Linda was referring to as the road use. Now you, get, under, you can understand what are the residential roads, what are your secondary roads, or your primary roads, what are your tertiary roads, <coughs> where are your alleys, where are your park trails. All that stuff is neatly categorized uh, thanks to this. And you can visualize this uh, in the same way by going to the Properties tab, going to the Symbology tab, going to the Categories option here. You're going you're to want to select the Unique Values option here. And then in this case, the interesting uh, aspect is the Type. So click on Type here. Click on Add All Values. And this is going to look for all the options you have here. You can choose a color ramp for how you want to graphically represent this, these series of road types. Um, so this is now just artistic choices that you can choose. Um, but you can always change these colors later in Illustrator and all that fun stuff. Click OK. And now you get a, a, a cool map that kind of represents more of a, of a hierarchy of roads there. And so this is uh, extremely useful for you know, understanding what roads are, are worth uh, you know, developing on, which roads are residential and you don't want to touch. You can obviously go back and customize your symbology uh, on the side here. So let's say the residential roads are fine, but we don't need to really focus on that. We want to focus on more uh, the, uh, the uh, primary and secondary roads. So if you click on the residential option here, you can maybe turn the symbol into a much thinner line and maybe a light gray line so it's not as pronounced. So now I begin to focus on more of the important uh, road networks of this region. So don't be fooled that this is just an aesthetic choice, right? This is a value judgment as you do things like this. Correct. Um, right? So as you change the way things look on your map, you're changing their significance. So just keep that in mind. Exactly. Everything you do, and th the way I describe map making is it is a creative design decision. So when you're, when you're choosing what to show and what not to show, you are really making design choices. Um, that is going to influence your design project. Design, map making is an act of creativity. It's not, um, not an act of inventory and uh, objective, uh, objective analysis. Right, that's why this is your first project. It's actually a project. OK, I'm just going to pause real quick. OK, so uh, quick, quick aside. Um, you're talking about how it feels completely different, the, uh, 
uh, zooming in and out of ArcMap feels completely different with AutoCAD, feels completely different with Rhino. To change that, you simply go to the Customize button here, go to the ArcMap options here, and you can go to the General tab right here, and at the very bottom, there's this mouse wheel option here. So right now, it says roll forward, drag up, is zoom out. If you just switch that and click OK, this now feels exactly like AutoCAD. So that's a good way if you're confused about how this feels with your hand or your mouse, that's how you would adjust that. Okay. Um, all right, guys. Continuing on, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to my art catalog. Go back to the Kansas City folder. And now I want you guys to go into the cadaster, this little uh, geodata database right here. And in here, you're going to get all, every information that you can find related to parcel information, ownership information, property line information. This kind of stuff is super, super important, especially in professional practice. Like people want to know what they own, what they don't own, because they want to buy that property. So when you're talking about urban design, parcel lines is extremely, extremely important. So understanding how to uh, use this information will help you with your studio projects. Open the cadaster folder and open the, uh, the sub-cadaster folder within the cadaster geodatabase here. And you'll see a shapefile here called parcels. By the way, if you, if you don't recognize these symbols next to the options here, this little symbol that looks like a series of uh, lines and dots, that means it's a polygon. That means it's a closed shape. Um, if it just looks like a line like this, that means it's just a, uh, a line. It's just, it has no area, basically. Um, and if it's a dot like this, it means it's a point information. So bring, take that, click that parcel map and drag that into your drawing here. And this is the, uh, the parcel uh, map of the Kansas City region. Always check the attribute table when you start uh, with uh, adding data sets to see what information you have here. So just looking at this right now, it has uh, some information about the land use. This is very useful right here. Has some uh, relate, something related to status. I'm just I'm just reading this out loud. Um, address, ownership, extremely important right here. So this will allow you to visualize ownership on certain parcels, um, and a bunch of other things. Um, yes. Okay. Moving forward. So now that we've added the parcel map into the uh, data frame, let's visualize the, visualize this in terms of land use. So I'm. Pretty sure you're probably going to have to make a land use map of Kansas City and St. Louis. Go to the properties, go to the symbology tab here, go to the categories option, then click on the option that says land use code. And click add all values, and what this is going to do, it's going to bring in every single land use for uh, every single parcel onto your drawing. And if you click apply, you'll see that it, it uh, let me just click OK real quick, it will. Uh, it will just color everything based off its land use. So this is extremely useful for understanding what property uh, is residential, which property is commercial, uh, that kind of thing. Now the problem with this currently as a drawing is it makes no sense, right? It makes completely no sense. It's just a bunch of you know, squares that look like a bunch of different colors. Um, you can't really tell the difference between what this area means compared to this area means here. And that's because for some reason uh, it, the color ramps always mixes up the colors in a weird way. But if you look at the actual codes, like 111 through uh, 100,000, these are all residential actual uses. So in a way, you actually all these here should just be one color to make sense. So the easiest way to, to just manually adjust this is to select, shift select all your land uses in this case, I say basically everything that has the uh, 1,000 value, if you right-click on that selection, you can click on Properties for All Symbols, and now you can just simply set a basic color for all these symbols. In this case, land use should be yellow. It's a, uh, a very generic, oh, actually, sorry. I made a mistake. I think I must have collected, yeah, I must have collected Properties for All Symbols. I probably should have said uh, Properties for Selected <coughs> Symbols. Uh, that's okay, that's okay. Uh, let's just move forward to the next layer, which is these two, the 2000 layer. This is commercial and office, so this should be red. So this time click properties for selected symbols, then make that a red color. So now you begin to see like the, the streets with stores and businesses and that kind of stuff. 
And then from there, just continue to col uh, color these things based off their land uses. Um, and you should know your generic land use colors uh, just from, uh, you know, uh, you know, generic land use colors. Uh, industrial is purple. Uh, 4,000, these are all institutional things, so these should be blue. Properties for selected symbols, blue. Apply. These 5,000 layers, these are just some kind of uh, utility slash uh, right of way. So let's just do some properties for selected symbols. Let's make these gray. Click OK. 6,000, these are like some kind of cultural uh, spots, theater, social, church, historical. Maybe we make these uh, orange <coughs> or some color. Apply. Park is green, so make just, uh, well, let's just do park and grass. That's fine. Let's make these green. Um, then everything else, these are just some optional ones. I'm just going to make these uh, gray for now, just to speed up the tutorial. So now if you look at this drawing here and you zoom out of it, it begins to make perfect sense, right? You begin to see that this is your central business district. All the development is coming off of this area here. This is all residential area. You can see like the industrial belt uh, of this area here and some areas that are just residential. So this makes perfect sense as a land use drawing. All right. Um, actually. All right. So next we're going to take this parcel map here and we're going to start adding <coughs> adding information to it um, that you can, other, other pieces of information that you can find in the Cadaster Geodatabase. In the Cadaster Geodatabase, you'll see there is a table here called Assessed Values. Drag that into your document. It's going to actually affect the table of contents to look differently. It's uh, usually defaults to this option, the side of the table of contents, where it's just listing the objects uh, just by layers, but there's a object uh, next to that called list by source, and uh, if you have information that is not spatial, in this case, this table here, this table doesn't actually visualize itself on the map in any way because it doesn't relate to any uh, shape. But this is basically uh, land value information as it relates to uh, certain parcels on the map. So. If you want to take this information and you want to join it to your parcel information, you got to use a function called joins. And this is one of the most important uh, functions of GIS as it relates to uh, ownership. Because usually, and especially for things like for the city of St. Louis, you're going to find a parcel map, but that's not going to have anything related to, in, in terms of ownership or uh, uh, land value associated with that shape file. You're going to have to join information to it using this method that I'm going to show you right now. Otherwise, you can't visualize uh, uh, land value in any way. What you need to do is you need to go to the parcel layer, right click it, and go to this line called joins and relates. And then click on join. It's going to ask you what you want to do. You want to join attributes from a table. This is correct. Leave this as is. Choose the field in this layer that the join will be based on. Okay, before I continue, you need to understand what may, what information from this table is the same as the information from the assessed values table. It Usually the column line will have an identical ID number or some kind of uh, parcel number that you can use to link the two. I'll just tell you right now that uh, this number right here, this pin number in the assessed values tables is identical to the uh, Kiva pin number right here in the uh, uh, parcel map. So these two Line, these two columns match uh, in both tables, and you can use this to relate the two. So go back to the parcel uh, layer again, right click it, go to join, keep this as join attributes from a table, choose a field in this layer that the join would be based on, that is going to be the Kiva pin. Then choose the table to join this layer, in this case the assessed values table that we already added to the map, just leave that as is. Then it asks you to choose the field in this table that the base will be joined on, and it already automatically selected the pin. So now you have your Kiva pin, your pin. It knows the connection. Keep all records. That's fine. And then click OK and just let it work for a second. But it should, it should be done. So if you open the attribute table for parcels and you go to the end of it, you see the numbers for your land value now 
pop up on the very end of it. So now the table that was once a separate table has now been merged in the right way to your parcel map. And so now all you need to do is have fun and just go to the symbology tab, go to the quantities option here, go to the value field here, and go to one of the land value options. In this case, let's try assessed land value. Sometimes this pops up where it says maximum sample size reached. Um, if this happens, that basically means there's, it, it's probably too much information that, that ArcMet can handle. And what you might need to do is you might need to reduce the amount of uh, shape files on your screen. So um, actually, let's just do that because it probably would help. Let's say um, you want to let's go to the Kansas City CBD bookmark again. Let's say let's just export uh, the information you see on the screen right here. Right click on parcels, go to data, export data. All features within view extent, remember that. Data frame, I'm gonna call this parcel KC CBD, because it's Central Business District. Click OK. And I believe, if this works correctly, um, if you export a map with information that's joined to it, the exported, exported layer will have that joint information baked into the new export. So it'll be there permanently at this point. A join is a very, is a loose connection. If you remove the table from your ArcMec document, it's going to remove that join. But if you export it together, it's all together again. So you want to keep that join land value um, on your um, information. If you open the attribute table for this, it should have, yes, the assessed, all the numbers already on the side baked into it. So it's now part of the shape file. So double click this new export that, in this case, I just made. Go to quantities. Go to the assessed land value. It still does that. I guess we have to deal with it. Um, and then just pick a number, uh, a range of classes, and then just click apply. Click OK. And now this is a, a very interesting map. It basically <laughs> shows, you know, relative land value across the entire uh, area of St. Louis. I usually recommend for some of these uh, parcel lines to um, properties for all symbols. Get rid of the So let me do it. Um, to get rid of the outline color. Uh, for some reason, I can't change them all at once. I just try selected symbols. OK, for some reason, that does that. Get rid of the outline on the border, and that makes the map much easier to read, as you can see now. OK. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about 3D information and how to bring that into your map. In the Kansas City folder, there is this folder called uh, NED19W blah, 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 blah. What this here is a, is a DEM data set, a digital elevation model. If you click on the, the top line, the, the, the item that has a .img extension, there's, a, there's no one on the bottom that has a .jpg extension. Don't, don't touch that one. Take the IMG extension and drag it into your map. This is, uh, if you care about landscape architecture and you care about uh, terrain modeling, this is what you need to do that kind of work. This is basically pure spot elevations. What this image is, is basically if you zoom into this image, you can see the pixel lines. You can see the, 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 the resolution of this. Every single pixel is a number, basically. And every single number is a spot elevation. So you basically have a grid of spot elevations of the entire downtown region of Kansas City. It does, it's purely the ground elevation information for this region. Where do you get this information from? There is a resource that is uh, hosted by the USGS, United States Geological uh, Survey called the National Map Viewer. You go to this website right here. It's hosted by the USGS. I believe this website is on the little Word document I gave you guys. Through this website, you can download topo information or this DEM image for anywhere, for anywhere in the United States. 
Uh, the way you do that is by zooming into the site that you want information for. Let's just say uh, St. Louis, for instance. Zoom into St. Louis. What you want to do is you want to click on the option that says, that's called Elevation Products. Let's check those about the little box right here. It's going to give you some categories of resolutions of this DEM image that you can download. Always choose either a one-third arc-second DEM or a one-ninth arc-second DEM, depending on what's available. Sometimes you don't get you don't you don't get both. Sometimes there's only a third arc-second, and sometimes you know you you one sometimes you won't get the one-ninth arc-second. So always check both boxes just to be safe. And I believe, for instance, I believe for some reason your computers don't give you the option to choose a file format. Um, I, I'm not sure why that is. But if you do get this option, you want to choose the IMG option here. If you don't have this option, don't worry about it. I'll show you what to do on the next page. So once you have this set up, click on Find Products. And this is essentially going to give you a list of potential raster images that you can download. And if you don't have the option to select IMG, just need to make sure that the format right here, this little line, has an IMG extension. There's some other extensions that you can download, but don't choose those ones. Always choose the IMG, because that will be the, the only thing that you can geoprocess uh, in ArcMap. And the way to understand what, uh, where this lies in a map is simply to click on either the footprint uh, option here, and it shows you what, uh, where that uh, information lies. Or you can click on the thumbnail, which is gives you a quick preview of what it looks like. And so you can use this to quickly understand where um, you can get information for uh, for this region. So for instance, like this is a good resource for getting topographic information for this little section of St. Louis. But for some reason, it doesn't have information on this side, so you might need to find uh, another map to supplement that. Or this, or you can use this one third arc second, which is also OK. Anyway, uh, and then what you do is you click on the uh, shopping cart right here, like that. Go to the cart, view cart and then just click on the download button right here to get that information. And when you download information, it'll come, it'll download as a zip file, and then you unpack that zip file, and then what you basically get is a file that looks like this in your Archimatic document. So now we want to take this map here, and we want to cut contours from this map. So I'm going to go back to my bookmark, Kansas City CBD. Um, actually, this is a bit too wide of an extent. This is, uh, this is way too big. I'm going to zoom in to just the downtown area, just this little section right here. I'm going to click on the zoom in button right here. I'm going to zoom into this little area like that. That looks OK to me. I'm going to set a new bookmark, create bookmark. I'll call this KCCBD2 because it's another zoom in of that. Quickly save my file so I don't uh, lose my progress. To cut contours of a site, you want to make sure your 3D analyst and spatial analyst extensions are enabled. So go to the Customize button or menu at the top. Go to the Extensions button here. And make sure in here you just have 3D analyst and spatial analyst, these two options here, checked. If you don't have these checked, it doesn't work. <coughs> what you want to do now is you want to go to the Arc Toolbox. And uh, if anyone who's used GIS in the past will tell you that Arc Toolbox is basically where all of the fun happens. This is where all your analysis, all your geoprocessing, all your data analysis, this is where you get your, this is where you can uh, do that kind of work. To cut contours, you want to go to the 3D Analyst toolbar at the top. Un, uh, open that drop down menu, go to the Raster Surface option here, and then go to the Contour option and double click on that. So it's going to ask for a few items. It's going to ask for a raster. That raster is going to be the image that you downloaded. So drag that into the raster line here. Just wait for it to populate. It's going to ask for a location to save the new shape file. Uh, this is going to seem like a completely arbitrary reason, but I generally recommend you just leave this as is. For some reason, I've had problems in the past where if I actually give it a location to save, it, it doesn't work. And I'm not sure why. Um, so for a completely no, no particular reason, uh, just leave this as a default 
location. It's going to save into a default geodatabase somewhere on your, on your computer. That's okay. It's not a big deal. A contour interval, so that's how far each contour line is from each other. You know, one foot, two foot, three foot, five foot. Let's do one foot because we want uh, a lot of detail on our contours. And then the Z factor. The Z fa so one thing to know about these images, these DEM images that you get from the USGS resource is that these numbers you see here on the side are going to almost always be in meters. So if you want your contours to be in meters, you leave your Z factor as one. But if you want your contours to be in feet, you need to know the conversion factor from meters to feet. And the conversion factor you need to remember for this is 3.28084. And I believe on the side here it tells you, uh, like right here uh, somewhere, yeah, 3.2808. Uh, but actually this is a, a lot more precise of a conversion. There's 3.28084 feet in a meter. So if you, if you put this number right here, it's going to cut the contours in feet. Before you click OK, click the Environments tab, this little button down here. You're going to want to set the processing extent uh, to be the same as display. So go to the processing extent uh, drop down in the environment settings and click on this extent and click on the same as display extent right here. And then go, and that's it, that's it. So just click on OK. And that means it will only cut contours for what's in your window right here. If you don't choose that processing extent option, uh, it's going to cut contours your entire raster set. It's gonna, you're going to get a huge set of contours, which you may want or you may not want because it's going to be too big. So click on OK. And just give it a second to do its thing. All right, so now that we have our contours cut, uh, now you should be able to visualize this terrain uh, using the Symbology tab. Again, so double click on the contour layer here. Go to the Quantities option here. Go to the Value field and click on the Contour. And you can increase the number of classes to something like 10. Pick a color gradient. Let's say we want to use the, uh, this one here. Then click on OK. And this is essentially your uh, terrain map of, uh, your contour map of Kansas City. And as you can see, Kansas City has actually has quite a dramatic topography on the site. So being able to model the site topography for this particular city is actually gonna be extremely important for your urban design studio, I think. Um, you cannot, in any circumstance, do design work on a flat map for Kansas City because it doesn't have that kind of topography. So. Um, you got to understand where the high points are, where the low points are. Um, so that's how you set that up. Okay, so now what I'm going to show you how to do is how to take this building information here and uh, give it building height information. Let's say you want to take this building layer here, you want to model the urban context uh, in 3D. If you open the attribute table here, you'll see you have nothing in the table here that talks about building height. So how do we figure that? I mean, there's this label here, but it, it, the, the height field here is, is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which is weird because that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, these buildings have height to them. The way that I have uh, figured out how to do this uh, is to utilize LiDAR remote sensing imagery. You can download LiDAR information from this USGS uh, portal by simply clicking on this elevation source data option here and downloading LiDAR point clouds right here. For the purposes of today's tutorial, I'm not going to go over how you take LiDAR point clouds and process them in um, ArcMap, just because it's kind of a, a, a long process. But if you guys want to know how to do it, um, I can do a separate tutorial. I can like record this uh, outside of the class, and I can upload to YouTube, and you can watch it later if you want. It's just, it's just a little bit more complicated than uh, other processes. For the sake of this tutorial, I have already set it up for you guys. In the Kansas City folder, there is this KC LiDAR TIFF. If you drag that into your map, this is the end result of taking that LiDAR information and processing it in ArcMap. Is you can take what is essentially uh, uh, point cloud information and turning it into a continuous 
field of spot elevations, as you can see here. And this is your building height data. So if you click on the uh, color ramp here, you can change the ramp to something like this, like a rainbow ramp, and you begin to see building heights um, of Kansas City. And this is the key to taking what is a flat 2D map and creating uh, what I've shown you, I actually don't have it here, like the large scale 3D dramatic looking models of urban contexts. How do we take this information here and cross-reference it with the uh, building map here? What we need to do is we need to take this building map and we need to convert it into points first. <coughs> I'm gonna look at this Kansas City LiDAR map here and I'm going to um, make a new boundary, a new extents, kind of here, because you can only get building heights for areas that fall within the, uh, the LiDAR drawing here. So I'm just going to make an extents that looks kind of like this. And I'm gonna set a bookmark, create bookmark. Again, KC, I call this LiDAR. Okay, save my file. Go to the Arc Toolbox, the little red button up here, or you might pin it to the side like this. Go to the Data Management uh, Toolbox. Go to the uh, Features uh, option right here and go to the option called Feature to Point. Double click that, input features, drag the building layer or the structures layer into there. Make sure this box here is checked inside so that the point will fall within the inside of the, the building layer. And just leave this as is because it's just gonna be a temporary file. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna need this uh, long term. Click OK. Oh, actually, I, I, what I should have done, I sorry, I made a mistake. I should have uh, set the processing extent to be the same as display. That's not a big deal. Okay, so now we've successfully converted these buildings to points. If you compare the attribute table for this in comparison with the original attribute table, they should basically be identical. All you've simply done is you've taken that building footprint layer and you've turned it into a series of points. The reason we do this is because points can be uh, cross-referenced with uh, the LiDAR map. Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna see like where this point falls on the LiDAR map and put the elevation data that it sits on and join it to that point. And then we're gonna bring that information back to the original uh, shape file for the building layer and you'll see what happens. So what we need to do is we need to go again back to the Arc Toolbox. This is where all the fun happens. Go to the 3D Analyst option here. Go to the Functional Surface option here. Then click on Add Surface Information. The Input Future class will be those points. So drag these points into the Input Future class. The Surface will be this LiDAR map in the background. <coughs> and the output property will be Z, the Z value. Then just click OK. And when that's done, if you open the attribute table for your points, at the very end of the attribute table, there is now a Z value. This is your building height number. Um, now you see some of these Z values have a null. Those are the Z values that have fallen outside of the LiDAR point cloud right here. So these all have a null value. So that's not gonna give you a building height, which is too bad. So now we need to do what is uh, a join uh, function again. So this time I'm going to use a function in the Arc Toolbox that allows you to join data. Um, go to the data management option here. Go to the joins option here. Then do the join field option. Why am I doing this as opposed to just right clicking on this and join relates? No reason at all. This is just another way to do it. This way, this way is a, it, this, this way makes it permanent. Um, so it actually automatically joins that field to that uh, original table um, permanently. So it's just another way to do it. But you can, uh, you can still do it the same exact way that we, that we did previously. So turn on the structures. The input table will be the original building footprint layer, the structures here. The joined field, again, we gotta find a field that's identical between the two tables. 
So uh, usually the ID number, the FID number, will work for this. The join table will be the new point layer, so this little point layer right here. And the, the join field is the field that matches the original join field here. So that is going to be the um, original FID right there. And then the field that we want to join to this map is going to be the Z value. So once this is all set up, uh, click OK. All right, so what I'm going to show you now is how to take this information and bring it into AutoCAD. Um, so what I have here is the original topo map that uh, we cut earlier. If the, so in a nutshell, the way you bring information from here into uh, AutoCAD or Rhino is to right click on the layer, go to Data, Export to CAD. And the general process that I recommend doing this is uh, first setting the file type to a DWG, obviously, choosing a location. In this case, I'll just set on my desktop. I'll call this Contour Export KC for Kansas City. Um, I have to misspelled KC. Um, and then go to the Environments tab and make sure output coordinates are set to same as display. That's going to make it match the units that you set as your main uh, coordinate system, in this case the Missouri West feet. So set that to same as display, then also set your cartography to be also same as display as well. And then click OK, and then click OK. And I have Rhino open here just uh, uh, so it's ready for when I this finishes exporting. Just, okay, now it's done exporting it. It will automatically add the CAD file to your uh, layers panel here. If you open that file in Rhino, you'll see that um, it won't look right. <coughs> Let's go to perspective. What I mean by it won't look right, it's it doesn't have any elevation data associated with it. Um, the way you bring the actual contour information into, into Rhino or AutoCAD um, is to set the fields correctly. So go back to your original uh, shapefile here, open the attribute table, and you need to do, what you need to do is you need to add a field called elevation to the table here. So go to the table here, click on the add field button here, and type in elevation, just straight up elevation like that. And I, I use all caps, that seems to work fine. And then set the type. In this case, all of our contour uh, lines um, are in integers. So an integer option is fine, but I actually always recommend just setting your type to a double. That just basically means the numerical value here is extremely, extremely precise. If, for instance, if for whatever reason the contour values had decimal points, um, it would preserve that precision. So just set your type to a double, and then right click on the new column uh, header, go to field calculator, just click yes on that, and then set your elevation here to be equal to the contour, like that. Click OK. Just gonna think about that, and it's just gonna populate this side with the exact same number. So AutoCAD recognizes this column as elevation data. So now if you export this to CAD, same thing, uh, let's give it a name, contour export KC, I'll call this two, save. Again, the same exact process, output coordinates, same as display, cartography, same as display, click OK, click OK. Um, now it's exporting to CAD. Okay, now that's finished exporting. Uh, now in Rhino, let's just open the new uh, contour map, this one right here. And this now looks correct. As you can see now, this actually has Z value to it. So this is what you can use. And for a city like Kansas City, where there is a huge shift in topography all across this region, you're going to want to use this information as much as possible. Because you don't, like I mentioned, you don't want to build your or design on a flat site. Kansas City is anything but flat. So uh, you're going to want to use this as a base. For your, uh, for your models. So the video kind of like breaks between when I started to join the point layer to the building layer. It was taking too long, so I'm just going to do the quicker, uh, the faster version. Uh, turn on your structures layer, right click on this, go to the join and relates option, click on join. 
uh, you want to join this to uh, using your FID number to the uh, point future that we cross-reference the elevation data to. And then the field that will be joined is the same exact field because they're basically copies of each other. And then click, make sure this is selected, keep all records, and click OK. Okay. Now, if I turn off the point layer and I go to this, um, you should be able to see on the side of the attribute table here um, <coughs> the Z value. And there are some null values because of, uh, because some of the building heights aren't within the extents here. But if you, if you export this um, by its view extents, let's do it real quick, structures KC, two or three, whatever, two, save, okay. Okay, so now once you've joined, once, once you've exported that, now we have the Z value right here. And this is the building height layer. If I go back to the point feature here, this is the exact same number as the Z value right here. So this Z value, now just one note, one thing to note, that this number here is within the same range as uh, the, this feature right here, this 200, 300, that means these numbers are still in meters, actually. So we need to convert these numbers here to feet. As you remember, the only way to bring this height information into uh, Rhino correctly is to add a field and call that field elevation. Set the type to a double, click OK. Go to the elevation tab, go to the field calculator. Set that elevation equal to the Z number you see here. And because it's in meters, you need to add the 3.28084 scale factor to convert the meters into feet. So click OK. And now your numbers here are properly in feet. Export that layer to AutoCAD. Export data to CAD. Leave this all the same. Choose a location. Call these buildings. Click Save. Go in the Environments tab. Make sure the output coordinates are the same as display and the cartography is the same as display. Click OK. Click OK. Wait for that thing to export finish. Remove that. Go back into Rhino. Import. Building layer. And if you look at this very carefully, let me take the contours like a gray and the buildings like a red. You'll see that these buildings now uh, should be at the correct height. This original layer on the bottom was the old uh, thing, I believe. But these should be at the correct building height. Actually, this looks a little this looks a little wrong to me. I'm not sure what I did wrong here. I'll, I'll have to I'll have to look at this again. Uh, I'm not sure what I did incorrectly here. So I'm wondering if it 